Welcome to our special event today, co-hosted by Code California and AGL. I'm Bill Maley with the AGL Association. We are a nonprofit that aims to transform government and help it modernize through shared knowledge and community building. Uh, today we have a special guest, Rebecca Woodbury, Digital Services Director for the City of San Rafael, California. Uh, Rebecca will talk about her efforts to help make her city an open organization. Uh, and just as a reminder, we are recording today's session and we'll post it online uh, after the event. So please keep your microphones muted until we go to Q&A, which will be about halfway through the program. Uh, but in the meantime, please feel free to post your questions in the chat field at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to those. If you prefer to ask questions that way instead of unmuting yourself, uh, that's fine as well. So we'll try to get to all the questions. Uh, now, uh, before we go to Rebecca, uh, we have Angie Corarte, Assistant Secretary for the California Government Operations Agency. Angie, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me and for helping coordinate this great event. We know you're really busy and, and can't stay the entire meeting, so we want to um, kick off the program with you and, and really just start by level setting on Code California. Um, what is Code California? Certainly. So I work at the California Government Operations Agency. We help oversee procurement technology, human resources, and a couple of other uh, foundational components that make government work or not work, which we're working on fixing. Um, and last year we worked with the Department of Technology to develop an open source policy. And as part of the policy launch, I've been working with AGL and other key partners in establishing an implementation plan and strategy that basically uh, sums up in what is Code California. So Code California is an open collaboration between agencies, industry technology partners, civic technologists, uh, and anyone in general that's interested in building open organizations uh, by leveraging open source code uh, and just generally building an open culture. Uh, if you go to go.co.ca.gov, you'll be able to find a summary of the policy. We have drafted uh, an open source playbook that departments and entities at the state level or anyone in general can leverage um, to start sharing code. And then we've been working with the Department of Technology and some of our partners at the federal government on code.gov to revamp the existing code.ca.gov platform so that it makes it easier for government entities to start sharing their code. Generally, Code California is really just, it's more of a movement. It's, it's, a, it's a, a community of practitioners and people interested in, in collaborating. And so if any of you are doing any cool work, uh, whether at the local governments or within your organization in general, that you think we could benefit from, from having a space like Code California and sharing those lessons learned for your projects, uh, please let me know. I am looking to identify co open source champions at different organizations. Uh, and I'm really planning on leveraging the Code California community to start actively working on projects that will benefit not just the state, but the public sector in general. And so we naturally gravitated to working with AGL because they've been key partners in, in, in our efforts. And so I'm, I'm glad to, to have you all join us today. This is the first online forum of what we hope to have on a regular basis to ensure that we are building that community, creating awareness uh, and building the best practices that will go into the ever evolving playbook. Um, so if you do have any questions about Code California itself or about the policy or what we're doing with the platform, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. Uh, I will share my personal information on the chat and I look forward to hearing the great lessons that Rebecca will share with, with you all today. Thank you, Angie. Well, so you described this as a movement. Um, it's um, something that started uh, back from a policy that was issued in May. And even before that, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the movement. Where did this come from? Where, does the, where did this start? What's the impetus? You know, wh why, why are people interested in doing this? I call this a movement because it's, I believe it's a unique approach in how we're planning on implementing a policy. Typically, the state of California or government entities in general put out policies and the implementation is always the hardest part. And so I wanted to approach Code California differently in the sense that 
I want to build accountability and collaboration outside of just the people that are supposed to be complying with this policy, right? I want to make sure that this is an effort that is carrot driven, not stick driven. Um, make sure that we are building and expanding in that community uh, outside of just the state inviting and actively engaging local governments and partners, including the vendor community, uh, because open source projects in general um, and that effort, it's hard, right? And it really depends on, on having collaboration with other individuals to, to openly really successfully implement these type of efforts. And so um, Code California is that different approach in, in implementing what is supposed to be a policy, but really trying to create more of a community and a movement uh, to drive conversations and start um, opening the minds and encouraging organizations to, to think about how they're doing their work in a different way, in a more open, collaborative manner. Well, I have to admit, um, of the policies that I've seen ruled out in the state of California, and I've, I've seen a few, I've never seen a playbook to go along with a policy, which um, is fascinating, really, because, uh, you know, it, you're you, from the government operations agency, you're issuing a policy that applies to state government, you know, throughout the, the executive branch, and then also, um, you know, has something to do with the, the local uh, governments as well. And so um, this is certainly a, a unique approach. And um, by carrots, uh, what can you talk about uh, the carrots just a little bit? Like, why would someone be interested in, in participating in this community? I think someone would be interested in participating in this community. Um, because I feel like we have so much to learn from each other. Uh, and I've been working with the uh, Health and Human Services Agency and I know they've been trying to stand up an open source project. And it's hard to often find partners or other folks that may have that same interest that would actively wanna contribute to something like this. And so I think there's value in really building that community acknowledging that the playbook is is ever evolving right like we we're not going to get everything perfect at the same like, like at once um we need to acknowledge that we can learn from others and so the playbook will continue to evolve as we can as we add lessons learned uh, and best practices from from that community um so i think in being able to to create that environment and acknowledge that we're not in silos right like we really do depend on each other to to make this successful that that's the benefit of having this space uh and and really not not necessarily be stick as i said driven right like there is benefit in, in having incentives and having a community of individuals that are also if not experts at least interested in this subject matter and being able to to leverage each other's energy and collaborative sp spirit uh will take us further in the long run. So at the December 12th event that you mentioned, the launch event for Code California in the playbook, Rebecca was one of our presenters. We had a, a few um, Ignite talks at the, at the very end of the uh, two hour session. Um, I was wondering if you could set some context a little bit. I know you have to go in just a, a few minutes, but before you leave and before we go to Rebecca, um, can you set some context uh, for um, how does how does her story apply to the Code California, um, you know, theme? Yes, definitely, and I, I can't wait for Rebecca to to speak on the great work that she's doing at at the local level. Um, so we wanted to make sure that at this soft launch event. Um, that we created the tone of, of what we really need to be able to drive collaboration, right? And it starts with having organizations that are open, open-minded, open to change and agile. Um, and I think that the work that Rebecca has been doing at the local level is it's a great example of what an open organization and an open culture looks like. Um, and it's really showing and demystifying that it's okay for us to adapt to change that this is more than just open source code, it's really building an open community um, and being able to, again, expand on those collaborations and, and tapping into that openness and that mindset to be able to actually grow, right? Like it's about 
having a growth mindset as opposed to not. Uh, and so I, I am excited to have Rebecca share some of the cool work that she's doing that extends from uh, the open organizations, but also some of the cool work that they've been doing in open source uh, and sharing, right? Like sharing in general, um, the lessons learned at their organization that I think can also apply to people across the board. Doesn't matter if you're at the local government level or at the state level, we are all part of some organization uh, and we all could benefit from that open culture. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you, Angie. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Uh, we know you have to drop off and can't stay the whole time. But uh, with that, so uh, Rebecca, uh, before we get into your story, and you gave an awesome talk uh, in December at our event. Thank you again for doing that. Uh, before we get into the open culture of uh, the city of San Rafael, I'm interested in um, a little more in your background. Uh, these are, um, you don't meet very many digital services directors for cities, period. Um, so I would like to know your story. You know, how did you become the digital services director and what's the path there? Uh, wow. Okay. So probably, um, probably not a normal path. Um, I've worked for San Rafael now for about 10 years and I actually started as an intern while I was still in college. Um, I went to Mills College in Oakland and I got my bachelor's and my master's in public policy there. Um, and at the time, my interest was actually in transportation policy. Um, I had spent my early 20s uh, living abroad in Europe and as a, you know, someone who'd grown up in the suburbs of Northern California, I was so enamored by all these trains and subways. And when I moved back to California, I was like, oh, wow, we should fix this. <laughs> Uh, and so that was really my interest while I was in school. I also happened to graduate um, in the middle of the recession. So at the time, I, um, I got a full-time job during a hiring freeze <laughs> uh, in San Rafael and was just incredibly lucky and grateful for that in that time. Um, and my, temp my position was temporary. And so I was this, um, I don't even remember what my title was. They, they graduated me from intern to something. And I supported a variety of different departments, um, community development on some long range planning, uh, the redevelopment agency before those, um, when those still existed. And also at the time I supported uh, our information technology department. They were building a new website. Um, after the hiring freeze was over, I was hired as a regular employee uh, in the city manager's office, and that's where I spent the majority of my time. So I was, I think, at the time, I think I was the only analyst at the city. So that exposed me to a ton of projects and a ton of different work that touched all departments. Um, and guess just kind of year by year, my responsibilities increased, my authority increased. Um, and just gradually over time got exposed to more and more. Um, and then as of 25 days ago, actually, I officially became the director of um, a brand new department here that we're calling the Department of Digital Service and Open Government. Uh, so we're brand new and I'm building it, um, shaping it as we speak. I have spreadsheets surrounding me. <laughs> Um, and so we're, we're basically taking our IT division um, and turning it into something new. Um, so that's, that's the weird path that got me here. Wow, that's exciting. So you talked about um, your responsibility growing and growing over time. And that usually doesn't happen uh, without convincing people of your value and your mission. Uh, normally, they don't just give you more responsibility without sort of. Uh, so I'm curious, what what was your pitch or what you know what was your uh, what was the argument you were making to um, to make digital services more important or need more attention in your organization? Yeah, I think you know. A lot of my time, my, a lot of my early years in the city manager's office, I was like a policy generalist. So I was actually looking at a lot of external things like crafting ordinances and laws. And, um, you know, I did everything from, you know, cooperative purchasing for solar. I mean, just the gamut. 
But over the last few years, I really started heavily focusing more internally on our organization and really the intersection between community and employee experience of government. Um, and that I really just, the, the digital experience of both, um, of both how the community experiences us and then likewise our own employees, I found really fascinating. Um, just more and more of what people want to do is online uh, and what that experience is like for people is just incredibly important. Um, and that link to trust, uh, so the, the trust that people have in government um, is really, you know, how people experience it leads to how much they're going to trust it. And so I was really fascinated by that. Um, and I got to do a couple big projects. I got to revamp our city website for the second time, <laughs> I guess, in my career. Um, and also do some other digital related projects, um, revamp how we respond to questions and, um, and requests from the public. Um, but really just, you know, a lot of this was also led from the vision that our city manager and assistant city manager were setting around reimagining government in the 21st century. And, you know, they, when they say that to our organization, they really mean it. Um, they really want to reimagine how government is structured, what we do and what we don't do and how we do it. Um, and, and just how we function in the 21st century. And they're really committed to this work. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't be doing this work without them. Um, and so I think it's really how we've, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, I think it's really what we've built together and how we've been thinking about how do we um, how do we exist as an organization? Why do we exist as an organization in the 21st century? And the and that digital piece in, you know, in our time is just so incredibly important. You can't escape that. Um, and I think that, you know, over the years, like you said, yeah, you know, I've really grown and professionally matured here. I've had an incredible amount of mentors and a really, really supportive environment to do this work. Um, and I think I've just always tried to push the status quo. Sometimes I've been prudent about questioning it, sometimes not so prudent. Um, and I've made an incredible amount of mistakes uh, and I've learned from them and I've learned how to learn from them and, uh, and not beat myself up about them. But I also think that I've always, you know, as I've grown and matured professionally, I think what I try to who I try to be now is candid, vulnerable, confident, and humble. And I think it's those values that I, um, those traits that I value that also make me so attracted to this idea of an open organization, because that's what I think an open organization is as well. Um, and so, yeah, those are kind of the things that have evolved for me personally. And I think as our organization, as we've really questioned what government is in the 21st century, um, and, you know, part of reshaping government means doing things differently. And for that, the city manager said, we need a new department. So, yeah. Wow. Uh, fascinating. So uh, you've described the transformation that's gone on in your city and in a sort of 10 year snapshot. Um, I was wondering if you can, you know, if, if there are any examples of some of a sort of before and after, you know, something, a milestone that sort of describes the progress that you've made, I, anything to give us an example of uh, a before and after snapshot, you know, from the beginning of your journey. I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question the way you intend it. Um, I think for me personally was really the largest endeavor I've done, which is overhauling the city website most recently. Um, it's my favorite project I've ever done in my life. <laughs> um, you know, within two months we had a beta site ready and we had a beta site for a month and we launched, you know, we launched an, uh, our official site a month after. So I'm so proud of what this small and mighty team did. And um, this was this project really transformed me as I think a leader. Um, this was the first project I did using Agile, 
um, and, and, you know, and also doing it in an open way. So I was every week I was posting a blog about what we were doing or what we did and what we were doing next. Um, and I think that kind of opened my eyes to what it meant to work in the open um, and share what you're doing with everyone. Um, and I also just learned a lot about my own agency during that project um, and, and how to really truly take initiative. I think I, I think I really grew into a leadership role during that project. Um, and I think a big piece of that too is your website is such a huge tool for you to convey information and how you convey that how open you are about the information that you want to share with the public because government can often hide behind um, its own bureaucracy in a lot of ways and it can obscure information very easily <laughs> um, just in the way that it presents it so the approach that we took with the website um, i think also was you know how do we define transparency and how do we define communication and community engagement um, and i think you know it's beyond the letter of the law um, it's beyond the brown act and how do we embrace um, this openness culture through these different tools um, so i think for me you know when i think milestone i think you know what was this really big shift for me it was that project um, for personal and professional reasons. And, and so you're talking about your city website. Um, is that the same thing as the intranet? No. So that, that came after. Um, and yeah, we, we, we then used the same platform that we use for our city website. We built um, an open, oh, we built a website for employees. It's really not an intranet. It's, it's a website for our employees. Um, it's a public facing one. Yeah. And so, well, um, so at your, uh, at the talk in December, yeah. you, you talked about that uh, internet or, or whatever you want to call it, the employee yeah. website. Uh, as an example of working in the open, uh, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that for our audience today. Uh, what's, you know, what's the benefit of working in the open and what are some examples? Mm -hmm. So that the employee website is a huge one. So that really prompted, I mean, I think the, the main reason I built that was just out of deep hatred of the existing intranet that we had. <laughs> I hated it so much. It was like a SharePoint site from like 2003 or something that just no one ever used. And yet, people were always employees were always complaining about not knowing anything not having access to information about things um and really the information that they wanted once i kind of took stock of it i was like none of this needs to be behind a password this is like why would we build an intranet when we can just make a website and not have to burden people with a password or being on the city network or whatever um, and, uh, and so we just started building a website and it's interesting. I didn't even, I don't even think I really truly asked for permission. We just started kind of building it. Um, and, and honestly, I don't even know if the entire organization understands that it's not behind a password. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, we just started building it and growing it and it's in a pretty good space right now. It's, it's definitely still in development. You know, it always will be. But, you know, a lot of the things for me was I'm, I do not like to do uh, my own work. You know, back when I was like more of a generalist doing policy work, I was constantly reaching out to other cities about how do you do this? How, what are your procedures? What's your policies around this? What, how do you do this stuff? And so for me, this is just my way of also like just giving back to the local government community. Like, here's all of our policies. Here's our guides for how we do public engagement. Here's our guides for how we write staff reports. Here's how we work. Um, and just putting that out there for all local governments to see. So now all the networks that I'm involved in, I'm just constantly sending links to our employee website um, and, and sharing how we do things. Uh, and so I see a lot of value in that and I'm, I'm secretly just hoping to start a movement. So all cities do this. So I have to stop asking. 
<laughs> for information. Um, and I was really inspired by the City of Boston's website. They create a lot of their content in the form of these guides. So we've really tried to embrace that by creating these guides for how to do certain things. Um, and really moving away from like the PDF culture. So a lot of people make PDFs and just like send them out by email. And I just don't like for life of me, I don't, I still don't know what people do with those. I do, they print them and like tape them on their wall. I, I just still don't know what people are doing with PDFs um, that are just like immediately outdated as soon as they are sent. Um, so I love the idea of a website that you can just continually develop and grow. Um, and I also think it's a really neat recruiting tool because, you know, these days it's hard to attract talent. And as much as candidates are telling us how we should hire them, we're also selling ourselves as an organization. We're a small city. We got, uh, you know, we got to convince people to come work for us. And uh, this to me is a tool. This is them seeing our culture. This is them seeing how we work. We are. Um, you can even see the evaluation uh, that's online that you'll be your supervisor will, will use to evaluate you. So um, just putting all that out there, I think, is also a really great tool for um, showing who we are. Interesting. Yeah. So, well, I have to ask, um, that sounds like a pretty major thing. The employee website, the internet that's open for everyone to see. I can imagine that you ran into some resistance. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, if you could describe that and maybe how you overcame that. Um, the, yeah, there's some resistance. Some of it is noise that you just ignore, <laughs> frankly. Um, and, and then some of it, if there's some, if there's merit to it, we have some, we have some ways that we've worked around it. So for example, uh, there was a, a telephone roster that they didn't actually want to make public um, because not all the phone numbers were public phone numbers. So we just, I solved that by just posting it. It's now a OneDrive document that we link to from the website. So if you click that link and you're not on the city network, you can't view it. So we've kind of created these little pass. Um, passwords for the like the less than 1% of the content that needs to be protected for some reason. Um, and so I've kind of navigated those things. And then others, I think if you really just sit down and explain and ask and, and, and ask them, like, why do you think it should be behind a password? And you kind of have a conversation with the folks that that don't quite understand it. Once you have that conversation, it's pretty simple. And, you know, it's it's easy in a government agency when you kind of you can ask them, so what if a member of the public made a public records request for that information? Wouldn't we have to give it to them? <laughs> Couldn't they just post it online? So you can show them that it's kind of the fear doesn't have a lot of merit behind it. You know, what's the worst that can do if, if a member of the public knows our internal policies about something? What, what's going to happen? <laughs> so once you have those conversations, it's pretty easy to overcome some of that. Interesting. So moving on, um, at, at the talk in December, you talked about a book. It sounded like a, a book club sort of scenario, which sounds really mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, a book on open culture and open organizations. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, so um, we have an employee book club. Every couple months we have a book and somebody in the organization sponsors you. So they get to pick the book. Last one, the police chief had us all read uh, Watership Down. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of fun. And a lot of the books, though, are really about um, government, about leadership, about organizational culture, that type of thing. And I had had this book, The Open Organization, sitting on my um, desk for a while. Uh, Luke Fretwell gave it to me from Proud City. Um, and he, he had said, you got to read this book. So I had uh, procrastinated. And then it was actually the mayor's turn to host the book club. And he, the mayor came to me and was like, what book should I do? And I just handed him this book. <laughs> no, we should do this one. And so the, the mayor obliged. Um, and so we, we all read the book and we just get together at lunch and talk about it. And then Luke had actually put me in touch with a couple of guys 
Um, so, the, oh, sorry, the book is The Open Organization um, by the CEO of Red Hat. And so Luke also put me in touch with a couple of guys from Red Hat. And I arranged for them to like Skype into our little book club talk. So they Skyped in, talked a little bit. Um, and then and then the organization just kind of talked about the the book and the context of government. And we talked a lot about, yeah, what's the definition of transparency? And it means different things to different people. Um, there is there is kind of what transparency is by the letter of the law. And, you know, you've got to post it in the newspaper and you've got to make sure it's 72 hours in advance or whatever. The, there's those legal definitions of transparency. And then, you know, what I loved about that book is it just really talked about what the culture is of, of openness and transparency. And as somebody who's worked in government, you know, pretty much my entire career, um, I was just, I was just enamored by the idea of it and kind of struck by how not open government is. And I really, it just really doesn't make sense to me. After I read that book, I was like, wait, why is, of all places, government should embody this the most? Um, and, and so it was really transformative to me. Um, and I think, you know, for me, the value that I see is it's, it's like a lot of it is efficiency. Um, you know, most problems at work, I find when you really boil it down, they're communication problems. They are because people don't have access to the information that they need at the right time, or information is held hostage in people's heads or just simple things like people forget to include the right people in meetings or on emails and, um, and, and people finding things out too late for their feedback to matter. And it's like these communication problems can all be solved when you just have this really open culture. Um, and when you're, you know, project managing in an open way, people will have access to the information that they need when they need it. Um, so there's like this huge efficiency um, gain that I think an organization can get through this, which it, government can use. Um, and I, then I also just think the more you share, the more open you make things, the more feedback you're going to get. And that just always leads to better things, right? The more feedback, the better you can make it. So that I think is key. And then kind of going back to my earlier point, this is government. It just, it just makes sense um, based on who we serve, what we do, um, we should just, we should be open. Um, and, and we should not just for ourselves in our own communities, but I'm really passionate about scaling um, good government solutions to other governments um, and, and just sharing what we do for other communities. So I think that, you know, it, it just makes so much sense for government to do things in a more open, shareable way. Terrific. Alrighty. Well, thank you. Uh, that is um, a lot to think about. And we are about 35 minutes after the hour. So I want to make sure we have time to go to our uh, audience and, and uh, let them have a chance to ask questions. So um, if, if anyone uh, listening uh, wants to unmute and just uh, fire away, go ahead. We're going to come back and get to some of these questions online as well. So anyone uh, have a question for Rebe Rebecca? Hi, Rebecca. I love the last thing you said about sharing solutions. Do you have some specific ideas or things you're working on to help share um, with other agencies, successes you've had, or, uh, or even down right to uh, project plans? Um, sure. So one of the big ones, and this was actually something that I talked about in my talk um, at the Code California event, was um, I'm from Santa Rosa. And uh, when Santa Rosa was on fire last year, I um, had the honor of going to work under mutual aid as, on the PIO team in the Emergency Operations Center, uh, Center in Santa Rosa. And one of the things that I did uh, was I helped stand up a uh, mobile first website for the County of Sonoma and Santa Rosa to share and use um, to get information out to people um, on mobile devices. The County of Sonoma's uh, website didn't work on mobile, um, and uh, the Santa Rosa website was 
questionably worked on mobile. Um, and so that was um, a huge thing that we built. It's still up today, SonomaCountyRecovers.org. And um, that then got replicated um, for Paradise just recently. Um, so Paradise was able to use the site that we built for Santa Rosa and Sonoma County um, and clone it um, and, and stand it up in a couple of days in Paradise. And then now what we're doing in Marin is we're cloning that one. <laughs> and um, we are now creating Marin Recovers. There's it's sunny, blue skies, there's no emergency now, but we now have a site that's mobile first and ready for any community in Marin, um, even though you know it was largely built by a couple of us across a few agencies here, but any community in Marin is gonna be able to use it when they need it. So if San Rafael does, we're you know, the largest city here, if we need to use it, um, it's ready for us. Likewise, if the little town of Bolinas um, needs to use it, they'll be able to also. So we're building something that can be shared um, by any city here, um, regardless of size, uh, they'll have access to this site. Alrighty, we have a couple of questions uh, through the chat. Um, how do you get feedback from your citizens? Oh my gosh, um, lots of different ways. Uh, it depends. Depends on the issue. It depends um, on the audience. The 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 um, how we seek input always changes, um, and we're always trying new things. Um, we're actually I just had an email earlier today about um, whether we want to try using um, the next the poll feature on next door to gauge interest in um, potential future tax measures, which I thought was like, whoa, okay, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so um, it really just depends on the on the issue and the community. Um, you know, neighborhoods are different. Um, they have different relationships to technology. Uh, and so you have to find a balance between seeking information digitally and then also reaching out in person. Um, and it's really about striking that right balance based on the, the population that you're looking at. So we do, we just do a variety of things, um, anywhere from community meetings in the neighborhoods where, where they'll, they're gonna be impacted by something, um, to using digital tools like polls and, and maps that you can kind of pin down comments to. So there's a lot of different ways. Um, I would give us, I don't know. I'd give us like a B minus. We there's a lot of room for us to improve. Maybe a B. There's there's just so much you can just always improve. I'm being hard on us. Um, you can just always improve um, how you're reaching out and how you're getting feedback from people. I think the most important thing is that you're really trying to reach the voices that you don't typically hear from. Um, it's so easy to get those voices. They're like. They're, they're there. They're, they're at your city council meetings. They know how to navigate the process. They know how to talk directly to the mayor. Um, it's how do you tap into the voices um, that are not typically there. And I think it's about being compelling. It's about helping people understand the value and then showing that their input matters um, and, and that can be acted on. So trying to fight that apathy that exists. So... Alrighty, so next question. Uh, what advice can you give to go from buzz to doing? Sorry, I got distracted because uh, I thought of one more example to that previous question. Do, do you want to go ahead and give it and I'll, I'll re-ask the question in just a second. Yeah, so um, back on that previous question, um, when we wanted to get feedback on our web, on our beta website, we actually took a bunch of Chromebooks down to a bar and bought people beer if they <laughs> would try our website out. <laughs> so we had random people in a, in a bar downtown um, doing user tests for, for beer. That was one way to get random people to try something out. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so I'll ask this question again. Uh, what advice can you give uh, 
to go from buzz to doing. And I think that means from sort of like, you know, there's a buzz about something and actually you're into, you're moved into action. Uh, oh. I interpreted that question correctly. Oh my gosh. I don't know if my, so that really um, depends on the environment that you're in. <laughs> um, and so careful with that because um, really depending on the culture of your organization and, and your level, your authority, your autonomy, really. Um, I, I am, I'm in a very lucky place. I have a lot of autonomy um, and I, I tend to sort of do and, you know, the phrase ask for forgiveness later <laughs> type of mentality, but you have to be really careful with that. And even with that, you have to exercise really good judgment. Um, but I think you, I think you really have to show people stuff so that they can understand it. It's really hard to move past words. Like when you're describing what you want to do and you're trying to like, how do I tell these stories to be more compelling and get my point across? It's really hard unless you just show it. So actually going back to the example up in Santa Rosa, I was trying, I spent one of my first day up there trying to tell them that we needed to build a new website that the county and the city could share and needed to be mobile first. And these exhausted, exhausted public servants were just like, no, we don't have time to do that. We've got to just use the website that we have. We've got, we don't have time to build a new website. And so what I did was that night I was sleeping on my parents' couch and I just literally stayed up all night and built the site. And the next morning I showed up and I said, here, this is what, this is what I'm talking about. And I showed them the site and they were like, oh, okay. And then they had something in their hands that they could take to leadership and they could take to people and say, here it is. This is what we're talking about. This is it. And it was like a tangible thing that people could see and, and touch. Um, and I think that that's, that's really important. So that this idea of like prototyping stuff so that people can experience something more because, you know, words and descriptions will only get you so far, especially when you are, are, are doing work that few people in your organization fully understand. Um, so building those experiences, uh, the, the website, again, getting a beta site up and running as soon as we could was, was really key to get the buy-in that we needed around having a new site. Great. Alrighty, so uh, we are, we're about, we're less than 15 minutes to the end of the hour, and I know we can't go all the way up until one o'clock uh, just to give us a little transition time to next meetings and things, but uh, we have another question from an application developer asking about what open source tools you've been using. So at this point, our department is brand new, so we're building a culture of open right now. Um, so the main one is the website is built uh, on open source tools. So it's a WordPress site, um, and uh, and it's built using using open source. Uh, but uh, behind me, I have a bunch of post-its that are that are our new department's visions and values and obstacles and opportunities. And there's um, post-its with the words open source all over them. So uh, we're looking forward to building um, a culture of open source here. Uh, but right now it's really just our website. All righty, uh, let's see. Well, I have one final question I, I like to ask. Um, I'm, I'm looking here to see if there's anything else. Lots of comments, comments about the beer, uh, <laughs> you're testing. Um, so l let me ask one final question and, and uh, we're gonna figure out a way to get your contact information, whatever you're willing to share, yeah. out, and, and any, any background materials out to our audience today so that um, I believe we have email addresses for everyone so we can distribute that and give them a chance to connect with you if you're Absolutely. available. Uh, and provide any additional information because uh, uh, folks are, are interested in, in keeping this conversation going and it's been really uh, great. Um, um, so uh, my here's my question. Um, you know, this is career advice uh, for yourself 10 years ago or someone in your position 10 years ago, 
um, to, you know, what would you, what would you say? What advice would you give? Yeah. Um, gosh, a lot of my advice is like general, like just if you're like a human, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, say yes to opportunities that are outside of your comfort zone. Always just always do more of that. I'm always like right now I'm outside of my comfort zone. <laughs> um, and this new position, I'm totally outside of my comfort zone. Um, so just always do that. Um, surround yourself with mentors and people who challenge you. Uh, you know, I love people who make me better. And that's not hearing that people think you're wonderful and don't change a thing because that in the long run just stagnates you and possibly can turn you into a crappy human <laughs> also. Um, so just really surrounding people who challenge what you think, um, challenge your ideas and um, and call you out and, and make you a better person. Um, Know when the timing isn't right, but don't give up on things that are hard. I have definitely, over 10 years working here, given up on things when they got hard. Um, not getting the buy-in that I needed and um, not quite, you know, being as compelling as I needed to be. And, and really, when things got hard, just being like, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm already really busy. I'll just do all the other stuff and forget about that. And I regret um, giving up on some things. Um, and so I think, you know, sometimes the timing isn't right and you know that. Um, but I think that, um, just knowing not to give up and that it's, this work is really hard and you have to under surround yourself with people that are going to help you and support you understand the value and importance and challenge to this work. Um, and I think, Lastly, and I think this is incredible to incredibly important to the work of digital is just always be empathizing, suspend your judgment, don't jump to conclusions, don't make assumptions. Um, there's always more to learn and the world is so complex and people are so complex and just learn to appreciate that about the world and do the hard work of listening and learning. So that would be my advice. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I wanted to just open it up one last time. If anyone wants to unmute, we do have a couple more minutes for a final question. I think I saw something through the chat that asked about the tweet behind me. So, yes. um, so this actually, this is my favorite tweet of last year. It says, making government work well is a matter of social justice because when government does not work, the pain felt is not equally distributed. It can be tempting to throw up one's hands. Please don't, many can't. So this is from Dave Garino from Get Cal Fresh, Code for America. Yeah. Very cool. All righty, anyone else have questions for Rebecca? All righty. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure. Uh, it was really uh, great talking with you. And I know there's a lot of people that are interested in following up uh, with you. So we're going to distribute the, um, your contact information. This, this recording will be posted on the AGL website. That's agilegovleaders.org, where you can also sign up for our newsletter and, uh, and uh, apply to be a member of the AGL Association. So please check out our website. And uh, Rebecca, once again, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Absolutely.